title of this message tonight is The Coming Pentecost. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we ascend to the hill of the Lord tonight, to the secret place of the Most High. And we pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would have perfect liberty here tonight. We acknowledge you, Holy Spirit. We pray that you would have perfect liberty in this house. Spirit of judgment and burning, we welcome you tonight. Spirit of the fear of the Lord, the terror of the Lord, and the burden of the Lord, we receive you tonight. Angels of God, we welcome you here tonight. And we thank you, Lord God, for the pillar of fire that is to come tonight. And I pray, Lord God, for an impartation of your Holy Spirit to this house. That has prayed and cried out for a move of your spirit for decades. And I pray, Lord God, for an impartation, Lord, tonight. Lord, that would bring that which they have desired, that which they have cried out for. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. There's a scripture in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. It says, uh, John the Baptist said, I need baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. For he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. In this passage of scripture, we see there are three baptisms that are identified. Water baptism. Say with me, water baptism. Water baptism. Spirit baptism. And fire baptism. fire baptism. And I proclaim to you tonight that there is a baptism of fire that's coming to America. A baptism of fire that will purge and purify the pulpits and the remnant church that God is raising up in this hour. A baptism of fire that will purge the pulpits of America. That the preachers of America will no longer tickle the ears of men but touch the hearts of men that they would be cut to the hearts. And true repentance would go forth in America that is requisite for the revival, the awakening that God is bringing. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, there is a description of the spirit baptism that God had brought. And he said, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. That I will pour out, say with me, pour out, pour out, pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And we see in the Old Testament that there is a requirement for the outpouring or the pouring out of God's spirit mentioned in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 23. He says, turn at my rebuke, surely I will pour out, say with me, pour out, my spirit upon you and I will make my words known unto you. You see, it's a conditional promise here. He just didn't say he would pour out his spirit. He says, if you will turn at my rebuke, I will pour out my spirit upon you. That same requirement is mimicked in the New Testament during Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, that Peter said to them, repent, say with me, repent. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all. Say with me, all. In the Greek, all means all. The promise is to all, not just a few. Not just the Pentecostals, not just to the Charismatics, but to all the saints. But there is a requirement. He says, you must first repent. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Why? So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And then he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before so that the times of restoration may come that was prophesied by the prophets before time began. You see, there are times of repentance, times of refreshing, and times of restoration. But before we can have the refreshing, there is a requirement called repentance. What are the times of 
refresh. Well, I believe Isaiah speaks to it. Isaiah 28 says, With stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. To whom he said, This is the rest which will cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. You see, the refreshing of the Holy Spirit must come first with repentance and an outpouring of a spirit that is followed with tongues, foreign tongues. A survey was taken in 2006, a little bit, almost 10 years ago, of the, of the Pentecostal churches throughout the world. There was a poll done of 10 nations, and they found that at least 40% of Pentecostals do not speak in tongues. 40% of Pentecostals. It gets worse. 49% of U.S. Pentecostals don't speak in tongues. That means half of the denomination that has their foundation in the baptism of the Holy Spirit haven't had the experience. There's a problem. 32% of Charismatics do not speak in tongues. So the question is, why? I'm going to tell you why. Because there is a requirement called repentance before there is the refreshing. So who canalizes this repentance? John chapter 16 says, Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. On a car, over, on a car ride over here, we were talking about the charismatic movement. And there's one thing that the charismatic movement is stripped away from the body of Christ, and that is repentance. We want to jump, we want to shout, we want to partake of the glory, but we forgot about repentance. The helper. No one wants to preach about the conviction of sin any longer. So how does the Holy Spirit convict us of sin? I believe Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4, gives us an answer. It says, the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. How do you realize that the church is filthy. We are a bride that's come with a muddy dress to the altar to be married. And God said, no, 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 no. I come from a first spotless bride. I come from a bride that's holy. He's washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. How? By the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burden. You see, the spirit of judgment convinces us of sin, which produces a confession of sin, which enables the spirit of burning to cleanse us of sin. Let me say that one more time. The spirit of judgment convinces us of sin, producing a confession of sin, which allows the spirit of burning to cleanse us of sin. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. And I believe that the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning together is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So how does the spirit of judgment convict us, convict us of sin? I believe there's two major ways that the spirit of judgment convicts us of sin. Number one, is having a divine encounter. Remember Isaiah. He came to a place of crisis in his life. And how many of you realize many of us have to come to a place of crisis before we'll turn to the Lord? This is in Isaiah chapter 6. Then the year that King Uzziah died, you see, Isaiah was friends with his king, with this king of Uzziah. And in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Say it with me. Saw the Lord. Lord. High and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. And when he saw the Lord, he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why? For my eyes have seen the King. You see, when you see the Lord in all of his holiness, there is 
a conviction, a spirit of judgment that causes us to be convicted of our sin. The spirit of judgment. Then he saw the seraphim come as he confessed his sins before the Lord. And the seraphim took a coal from the altar and it touched his lips. It says, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. The spirit of burning operating. Which ended up qualifying Isaiah for the ministry. You see, today, our qualifications are, if you're handsome, you wear a three-piece suit, and you can tell a few good jokes, you're fit to preach in America. But that's not God's qualifications. Amen? After he was cleansed of his sin, he said, I heard a voice. I heard the voice of the Lord. Who said, who shall I send and who will go for us? Who shall I send and who will go for us? See, I believe that the Lord is saying that over and over and over again from heaven. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? But until you're purged, until you're purified, until you're sanctified by the Spirit of God, you'll never hear that voice. Any percent of the body of Christ doesn't know what they're called to do. Why? Because they haven't seen His face. When you see him, you're going to be changed from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord, into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you have to ascend. You have to go to that secret place to be changed. Glory is the atmosphere of heaven. And God has privileged us and invited us to that open door in heaven. He says, come up here. We're saying, God, come down here. He say, no, you come up here. We say, no, Lord, you come down here. And he said, no, you need to come up here. Why? Because it's his riches and glory. And the atmosphere of heaven that's going to transform you, that's going to change you, that's going to make you who you are. So that you can fulfill the purposes of God for this generation. You see, we have resigned ourselves to the beggarly elements of the earth when God has riches and glory for us to partake of so we can bring those riches down into heaven and be the light of the world and the soul of the earth. The second way that the spirit of judgment convicts us of sin is the preaching of repentance. In Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, Peter went on a dissertation Preaching to them what was going on. The Pentecost message of what he had done to the Lord. And it says in verse 37. Now when they heard this. They were cut to the hearts. And said to Peter. And to the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren. What shall we do? What shall we do? When is the last time? Have you had sinners? Said what shall we do? The message was so convicting. Then they ran to the altars. What shall we do? He told them what to do. Repent and be converted that your sins will be blotted out. Amen? Be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a question for you tonight. Could the lack of convicting messages be prevented times of repentance? That's keeping back times of repentance. I believe that's true. But I believe that God is raising up a company of prophets in this hour. In the spirit of John the Baptist. In the spirit of Elijah. And even more so, a double portion of the spirit. In the spirit of Elisha. To begin re preaching repentance to America again. In Malachi chapter 3. Speaks of the messengers God is sending. Behold, I send my messenger. And he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly, say when he suddenly, come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord. You see, I believe that the Lord must come in fire. 
before it comes in the glory that we've been seeking. Amen. I believe that the pillar of fire must precede the cloud of glory we've been seeking. Amen. Why is it coming? Malachi chapter 3 verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. Say with me, fire. And launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Now listen to this. Listen. He will purify the sons of Levi. Say with me, sons of Levi. And purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, I've read this passage, I don't know how many times in my lifetime. But it stood out to me a couple weeks ago when I was studying for this message. The sons of Levi. And I began to ask myself, well, who are the sons of Levi? The sons of Levi were the Old Testament priests. Equivalent to the fivefold ministry of the New Testament. He's speaking to the leadership of the church. And he's saying that he must purify the church that we may offer an offering in righteousness. I believe that we've been offering offerings in unrighteousness from the pulpit. And because they're not rooted and founded in righteousness and justice, and we've been so bent on tickling the ears of men, God can't touch the hearts. Amen? But he's about to change all of that. You see, Samuel, Ezekiel, Ezra, and Malachi were all descendants of Levi. And Malachi connected the purification of the sons of Levi with the coming of God's messenger. You see, before the Lord can come in all of his glory, he's got to send forth messengers. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert, in the desert, in the deserts. A highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked way shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh will see it together. But first, God has got to straighten the pathways. He's got to have preachers to preach repentance. To prepare the way of the Lord. Because he's not coming until the church is pure and purified. Amen? For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Now Malachi goes on to say, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 5. And he says, I will come near you for judgment. Say with me, judgment. And I, the Lord, will be a swift witness. They will be swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, perjurers, and those who exploit wagers and widows and orphans because they do not fear me. He's talking about the sons of Levi. He's talking about sorcerers in the pulpit. He's talking about adulterers in the pulpit, perjurers and exploiters in the pulpits. And I believe that justice demands that all magicians, all adulterers, liars, and extortionists, that our pulpits are to be swiftly judged. Now, my Bible says that Jesus forever makes intercession for us. Amen. And that we have what's called the accuser of the brethren that accuses the saints day and night in the courts of heaven. Amen? But in this case, the Lord's saying, I'm not going to be an intercessor for these adulterers of these perjurers and exploiters. I'm going to be a swift witness against them in the courts. Why? God needs swift judgment to come on all these adulterers, liars, and extortionists. Why? Why? Because we have lost an entire generation because of our 
hypocrisy. Amen? We got a whole generation going to hell. I got a statistic for you tonight. 88% of children from evangelical homes, evangelical homes, 88% of children of evangelical homes at age 18 leave the church never to return. 88%. That's almost 9 out of 10. We've got a problem. We've lost an entire generation. Why? Because you can't put one over on the youth. Amen? Amen. They can tell a liar and a hypocrite a mile away. And God's tired of hypocrites, perjurers, liars, and extortioners in his pulpit. And he said, I'm going to be a swift witness against them. He's going to agree quickly when Satan says, I agree. Let's bring judgment to that. And I believe that's going to be executed as we cry out unto the Lord for a purging of the pulpits of America. What is the root sin? Out of the pulpit, what is the root sin? Greed. Covetousness. Jeremiah chapter 6 and 13. In fact, this passage of Scripture twice in Jeremiah 6.13 and 8.10 because from the least of them even to the greatest of them everyone is given to covetousness and from the prophet to the priest everyone deals falsely I love what the living bible how the living bible's translation of this passage it says they are swindlers and liars from the least of them right to the top. Yes, even by prophets and priests. You see, we've dealt false. Again, we've told them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. We've tickled ears instead of touched hearts. And we have run greedily in the air of Balaam, who sold out. For a big offer. Jude talks about it. In fact, Jeremiah identified covetousness as a sin that overcame Judah. The early church was subject to the same covetousness. James writes about it in his book. James 4. He says, where do wars and fights come from amongst you? Do they come from the, your desires for pleasure? In other words, hedonism and war, that war within your members. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and you cannot obtain. You ask and you do not receive because you ask of this. Why did you be spending on your pleasures? You see, James associates the sin of covetousness and hedonism or a love for pleasure with the worldliness that is defiled the church. You see, the church is bought into the American dream. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in essence, many, or if not most, Christians in America are committing spiritual adultery. James is addressing the church here, not the world. He calls them adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? That word enmity means hostility or hatred. Friendship with the world is hatred with God or for God. Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. I venture to say that 80% of Christians, they're in bed with the world and they think they're pleasing the Lord. But 80% don't even realize that they're enemies of God. As a result, we've got worldly, hiring prophets that have healed the hurt of the church slightly or superficially. Jeremiah 6.14 They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly. 
say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 8 says, And now, for a little while, grace has been shown to us by the Lord, that our God may give us a measure, say with me, measure, a measure of revival in our bondage. We don't realize it, but the American church is in captivity. We've been there for the last 40 years. We've been in spiritual captivity. And we've given the church a measure of revival. But I believe that measure of grace is running out as the season comes to a close. I don't know about you, but I cannot endure a measure of revival. I pray too long. I preach too long. I labor too long to see a measure of revival. I don't know about you, but I want to see an outpouring of God's Spirit. I want to see a deluge of His Spirit where millions are getting saved, not just a handful of people. Amen? We want to see a great harvest. But what's happened is the sickle is not even in the hand of the church. We can't reap the harvest. We're not going to see the signs, wonder, and miracles with a pulpit that are defiled. So we need more grace. And that grace only comes by humbling ourselves, the Bible says. For God resists the proud, but He gives what? Grace to the humble. But it's not the grace you've been hearing from the pulpits of America. That's called hyper grace, greasy grace, false grace, gospel. That gives millions a license to sin. You know, here's the thing about God's grace. First John 1 John 1.9. We use it, we shoot it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now God will forgive you again and again and again and again. But what did Paul say? Paul said, I discipline my body. I put it under subjection lest after I preached, I would be disqualified. See, what the greasy grace, hyper grace, false grace message does is gets people in a place where they're forgiven, but because they sin over and over and over again, God says, if you cross this line, I'm not going to be able to use you in your high calling. You've disqualified yourself from the high call of God. And see, that's what that message is doing. I can live any way I want to, and God will forgive me. Or, hear this one. God's already forgiven my sins. Past, present, and future. So why not just keep on sinning? God's already forgiven me. Well, there's a thing called appropriation. And repentance. Or forgiveness requires repentance, not an apology. But what we have done is that if we issue God an apology, that's good enough. God started your apology. He wants repentance. My Bible says, he who covers his sin will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes his sin will have mercy. See, we've left out that part about forsaking sin. That's what repentance is. You confess it, but that's not where it stopped. you got to confess it and forsake your sin. That's repentance. And we forgot to preach that in America. That's not the kind of grace I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about a grace that empowers you to overcome sin, not be a license to sin. James 4, verse 6 says, He gives more grace. Therefore, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. In verse 10, he says, humble yourselves, now listen to this, it's important. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Say with me, lift you up. Yeah. Now, I've read that passage of scripture hundreds of times. I always think, well, God's going to lift up your spirit. That's what it means. God's going to lift your spirit, 
up. You're not going to be so down and depressed. God's going to lift you up. It's not what it means at all. It doesn't mean it at all. Let me give you a clue as to what it does mean. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. Say with me, Holy. I dwell, the Lord, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who is a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. What is he saying here? That if you will humble yourself, the Lord will exalt you to the secret place, to the high and holy place, where you can receive his face, get real repentance, not an apology, Real repentance, you save him, you're cut to the heart, you forsake your sin, confess it and forsake it, he empowers you, he changes you from glory to glory into his image, and empowers you to do the high call. Not the low call, not the medium call, the high call of God. When he wants somebody, he says, lift you up, lift you up, take you high into his presence. That's why we've got to humble ourselves. That's why the motto over the last 40 years, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, what is the first thing he said? Humble yourself. Because that's the only way you're going up. That's the only way you're going to meet him in the secret place. This is who we So, the question tonight, how do we humble ourselves before the Lord? James prescribes three things. Number one, draw near to God. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. You see, it's your move. You have the white players or the white uh, pieces on the chessboard. You're white. So white always goes first. It's your move. You've got to draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. He's waiting. We've got to take, we've got to take that pawn, and we need to move it forward. Amen? Or you need to take that knight and move him forward. It's your move. You've got to move towards God, and then he will draw near to you. See, God, you for a Jacob too. We talked about it in Psalm 24. We talked about it last week. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in the holy place? He who has clean hands, a pure heart, who's not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. This is Jacob, the generation who seeks him, who seeks his face. We've been teaching the body of Christ for the last 40 years to seek the hand of God. He said, seek my face. Number two, James says we are to mourn over sin. Lament, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. In the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2, turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Let the priests weep between the porch and the altar. Spare your people, O God. Do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Yes, the National Day of Prayer was, what, about a month ago? I decided I, I, I needed to go to a National Day of Prayer. So I went down the street. They were having an event. Pretty large church. I walked in the building. There was 25 people about, well, let's just say they're older. Was there no prayer going on? They were watching the video. National Day of Prayer. There ain't no prayer going on. You see, America is in the balance. But without sincere, deep, heartfelt repentance, the severity of judgment in America will be severe. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. He says, Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes are fountain of tears, and I may weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Call for the mourning women, that they may come and send for stealing women, that they may come, run, make haste, take up a wailing, that their eyes would run with tears and 
your eyelids gush with water. For a voice of wind is heard from Zion. I got news for you tonight, church. There is no voice of wailing in Zion today. We don't even know what travail is anymore. We don't know what weeping and mourning for sin is. It's completely forward to us. We have a priesthood like Eli. Corrupt. Weeping, the mourning, the travail, and genuine repentance over sin. They originate with the burden of the Lord. You see, without the burden of the Lord, there is no travail. There is no intercession. There is no weeping and true mourning. The result is because, the reason why, is because we have not partaken of the burden of the Lord. And as a result, our repentance is shattered. Oh God, we're sorry for this one. We're sorry for that one. But there is not that deep repentance that is required. You see, most of ministry today is based on what's on man's heart, not what's on God's heart. Frank Bartleman, the intercessor of their Zeus's Great Revival, made this banner statement. He said, the depth of revival will be determined exactly by the depth of the spirit of repentance. There's an attribute of God that is repeated three times. No other attribute of God is repeated three times over and over again in Scripture. And it is the word holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of God. Heaven and earth is filled with His glory. It doesn't say lovely, lovely, love. It says holy, holy, holy. I believe that the burden of the Lord through the church it's for his bride to be holy. That is his burden. Ephesians 5, 27 says, that he might present her to himself. Who? He's talking about the church. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle. But that she should be holy. Without blemish. You see, without a holy church, a remnant church, a holy seed, there is going to be no glory. There is not going to be that revival. And I also believe that the depth of repentance will determine the depth of redemption. You see, we've got iniquitous root structures resulting from generational sin that run deep. In America. And surface little prayers are not going to uproot. The blood will not go deep unless there is deep intercession. You see, deep repentance is required for the blood of Jesus to go to the roots, iniquitous roots of sin. And that's the only way it can be uprooted. Repentance is required. We're coming into a battle, church. But the battle is not against flesh and blood on an earthly battlefield. The battlefield will occur in the courts of heaven. That's where our battle is. You see, for years and years, we're trying to dismantle and de dethrone principalities when we have no legal right. And to get the legal right to dislodge them, those throes of iniquity that we've heard about, it requires repentance because the blood must be applied to those sins and presented in the courtroom as evidence before there is a judgment written and executed on the earth. How many of you are still with me? You see, our battlefield is in the courts of heaven but the blood must be applied to the root as evidence that they have no legal right. Once the legal right or the judgment 
through praise and worship. It says that. Let me just read it. Psalm 149. Let the high priests of God be in their mouth, and a two ended sword in their hand, to execute vengeance on the nations, punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains. Those are the principalities and powers, and the nobles with feathers of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. Where is the written judgment? It's in the courts of heaven. When you get the written judgment saying, you now have legal right to dismantle that principality, that's when the apostolic and the kingly anointing allows us to decree and execute the judgment written. Does that make sense? But the missing ingredient that hasn't been preached is the repentance part. We would have think, oh, we can just go do a praise and worship service and take care of that. No, you can't. Because we've done it for years and years with no results. No true results. But when we apply the blood through intercession and the burden of the Lord to repent so the blood can go to the root of iniquity, that's where you can dislodge it and get the judgment written to execute that. And then through praise and worship and high praise, you execute it. That's when we're going to start seeing changes. Amen? Ezekiel 9, 9 says, The Lord said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed, and the city full of perversity. For they say the Lord has forsaken the land, though the Lord does not see. You see, we've got iniquitous structures that are built from years and years of perversity, sin, bloodshed, broken covenants that can only be resolved by repentance, not surface repentance. Because I've heard so many people, oh, we've already done that. We've already repented to the Native Americans. We've already repented to our black brothers and sisters. We've already done that. Okay, well, how come we still got all this racial problems? How come we, we still, the Native American still isn't being exalted to the rightful place? How come we haven't seen a revival? Why? Because the repentance has gone deep to the place where it needs to go. If you'd be asking me, where am I going with this? Ezekiel 22, verse 30 says, For I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of what? On behalf of a people? No, in behalf of the land. And God wants to redeem the land. Well, what I found in the body of Christ and through history is God sought for a man, but he ends up always finding women. Even look tonight, we have a majority of women. We've got some men here, praise God, but men. But we've got women. I'm going to talk to you about a woman by the name of Hannah. She had the burden of the Lord. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Little did she know she would be the mother of the prophet Samuel. It records in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow. She said, if you will give your maid, sir, a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And Hannah's travail was for to give him. He was a corrupt, compromising priest. He thought she was drunk. I bet you go in most churches today, and if you had some women with a burden of the Lord, and they were travailing, and they were weeping and mourning over the sins of this nation, and most preachers would say, get out of here, you drunkard. Get out of my church. Why? Because we have a corrupt generation that's completely forward. See, we want to dance, jump around, pray. That's all great stuff. Don't get me wrong. I'm as much of a praiser and jumper as any of them. But there's other aspects that we have forgotten. Hannah replied to her, No, the Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have poured out my soul before the Lord. And out of the abundance of my compassion, 
See, I believe the Lord is in search of a company of men and women who will stand in the gap in behalf of America. He needs a company of intercessors who will not only mourn over the sins of our nation, past and present, but have a burden for the Lord, for the true prophetic, to come back to America. You see, without the true prophetic, we will not see the revival that God wants to bring to America, to Arizona. The awakening that we've heard talked about, it will not come without the true prophetic message and mantle of repentance, the baptism of fire, the Pentecost that God's wanting to bring to this state and to this nation. In the book of Ezekiel, the Lord had a vision, or Ezekiel had a vision of the Lord. And it was a premonition of what was going to happen to Israel at the hands of the Chaldeans that would happen five, in five years. And Ezekiel saw the destruction of Jerusalem. And he saw seven men, and one of them was clothed in linen and had a writer's inkhorn. And the Lord said to the one clothed in linen with a writer's inkhorn, he said, go to the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who will sigh and cry over the abominations that are done within it. An exhortation to men to take on the burden of the Lord. And the intercession that's required to redeem this land, redeem this people, and see the true prophetic come forth. And to the women in Jeremiah 9.20, hear the word of the Lord, O women. And let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters, wailing, and everyone her neighbor, a lamentation. I believe that the Lord wants to bring an impartation tonight of the burden of the Lord. Number three. Number one was draw near to God. Number two, mourn over sin. Number three, purify your hearts. James says, cleanse your hearts, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded. And in the book of Ezekiel, it goes on. In Ezekiel chapter 10, in verse 1, and he saw the Lord speak to the man who was clothed in linen with an inkhorn at his side. And he spoke to him and he said, go in among the wheels under the cherub, and fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherub, and scatter them all over the city. Scatter them all over the city. I believe that the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church, that He's looking for a company of prophets that will scatter the coals from underneath the throne of the altar, and scatter them as the spirit of judgment and burden fills our city, fills Phoenix, Arizona, fills Arizona, and fills the United States. I believe that there is a pillar of fire that we must embrace. Every time I preach, I see this pillar of fire form before me. And God is saying before the cloud of glory can come to Arizona, that we must, as a remnant church, embrace the pillar of fire. And the reason why this isn't preached is because the masses won't receive. That's why. That's why I'm preaching this message to the random church. Those that have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. We want to hear the milk. And the milk is spoken to the masses. Oh, there's great glory coming to Arizona. There is, but there is a condition. And I'm bringing that condition to the random church that we must embrace the baptism of fire. We must embrace the spirit of judgment and of burden. We must embrace the pillar of fire that is free. Put it all on the altar. I believe God's going to work intercessors tonight. Who's running for the baptism of fire? Andrew, if you can come. <laughs> 